Tonight's presentation is Why Valves Stick? Our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated, and he's an author for numerous aviation publications. Mike has a uh, certified flight instructor certificate, AMP mechanic certificate with inspection authorization privileges, 2008 uh, FAA Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year, and a member of EAA. Mike, thanks a lot for being with us tonight. I'm gonna to turn control the presentation over to you. Well, good evening, Tim, and good evening, everybody. Um, let's see if this is gonna work. I am uh, coming to you from a hotel room in Alamosa, Colorado tonight, where uh, I am having a whole bunch of old avionics pulled out of my Cessna 310, uh, lots of vacuum hoses and stuff that I don't, I'm not going to need anymore, and a couple of brand new bleeding edge Garmin GI275 uh, instruments going in, in instead. So if everything works out okay, I will be able to fly home this weekend. Otherwise, I will be in Alamosa for a little bit while longer. Um, <clears throat> Tonight's presentation uh, is entitled Why Valve Stick? Um, geek alert, <laughs> we're gonna be getting into, into some, some uh, pretty uh, geeky, although interesting stuff, but this is a, a subject that uh, is a particular concern to uh, people who fly behind like homing engines, although it's been known to happen to other engines as well. And it looks like we have um, a very nice turnout tonight. Pretty close to 800 geeks so far. <laughs> very good. Any rate, um, so let's talk about valve sticking. <clears throat> if you fly behind a Continental or Lycoming, uh, each of your engine cylinders has two valves, an intake and exhaust valve. Uh, the big one's the intake valve, the little one's the exhaust valve. And these valves um, open and close by sliding in and out through uh, uh, close tolerance tubes called valve guides. The valve guides are pressed fit into the cylinder heads and the, the uh, valve stems um, are inserted into the valve guides. And um, then the valve is opened and closed through a valve train that on <clears throat> these engines consists of uh, a cam, a lifter, a push rod, a rocker arm, um, uh, which opens and closes the valve. Actually, the cam opens the valve and some valve strings, a couple of concentric valve springs, uh, close it again. Now, a sticking valve is one that, uh, that no longer slides smoothly through the guide because it has a buildup of deposits um, on the lower valve stem. Um, sometimes those deposits also wind up transferring and accumulating into the lower portion of the valve guide. But when deposits build up, uh, the valve will have a hard time sliding smoothly through the guide and we wind up with a uh, sticking valve. Of course, most of you already knew all of that. So let's go into the stuff that you might not know. And that is, what these deposits are made of. It's not carbon. What causes them to form, it's not heat. Uh, what happens when they do, it's not pleasant. And how to prevent this from happening, it's not that hard. Um, so let's talk about uh, uh, what the symptoms of a, of a sticking valve are, first of all. There's not much clearance between the valve guide and the valve stem, uh, and it's intentionally tight so that the valve um, remains perfectly concentric with the seat and uh, and, and and closes uh, completely when when the, the the valve is retracted by the valve spring. Um, now that stem to guide clearance, which isn't very much is at a minimum when the cylinder is cold and loosens up a little bit when the cylinder heats up. And that's why when a valve starts to get sticky because deposits start to form on the, on the stem, it is first noticeable 
um, right after the engine has started cold, when the cylinder head temperature is cool, and that uh, clearance between the stem and the guide is at the minimum. Um, when the valve uh, sticks, um, it causes the cylinder not to make power. And it uh, typically manifests itself by a rough running engine. The engine is running rough because the cylinder that has the sticky valve uh, is, isn't making power. And um, uh, so that's you feel that as engine roughness. And if you have an engine monitor, you'll also notice that that cylinder isn't making EGT. Again, because the 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 sticking valve is preventing it uh, from making power. But then as the engine warms up and uh, heat gets transferred from the other cylinders to the cylinder that's that's not working properly, uh, that valve to guide clearance loosens up and the valve gets less sticky. And so the rough, roughness diminishes and ultimately disappears. And typically by the time you get to the run-up area, the engine's running smoothly. And, uh, and all of the cylinders are making normal EGT. Now, a lot of pilots will incorrectly attribute um, a rough running engine right after start to an oil fouled spark plug, um, but that's almost never the reason. Uh, if you think about it, um, the, the engine will run smoothly even if half of the, the, the plugs aren't working because there's two plugs in each cylinder and the engine runs just fine if even one of those is firing. Um, so roughness when when coal that, that goes away when the engine warms up is almost always due to valve sticking. And when that symptom occurs, um, you have to treat it seriously, treat it as a warning, because if you don't act reasonably promptly to resolve the, the sticking valve, then as the deposits continue to uh, build up on the valve stem, it can get to the point where the valve can stick um, when the engine is making power. And if that happens, um, some some serious engine damage can occur. Um, and it, if it happens at the wrong time, it can result in an in-flight emergency, um, conceivably an off-airport landing, that sort of thing. Um, a valve that gets too sticky um, can get stuck hard, um, either open or closed. And uh, this can get pretty ugly. If, if the valve sticks um, closed, then when the cam tries to open the valve and the valve is stuck closed, something in the valve train has got to give. And the thing that most frequently gives is the push rod because it's sort of the weakest link in the chain. And the push rod will wind up bending because it, it's trying to open the valve, but the valve didn't want to open. And um, uh, once the push rod bends, um, and this photo shows a case of a bent push rod that's actually fractured the, the push rod housing on, on a light homing engine. Um, but once the uh, push rod bends, of course, um, there's no chance that the valve will ever open again. And so you're you you wind up flying behind a an N minus one cylinder engine. Um, if it's a six cylinder engine, um, you're probably going to land at the nearest airport. And if it's a four cylinder engine, you might wind up landing off airport. Um, on the other hand, if the valve sticks open, that's even worse. Because if the valve stick op sticks open, what's likely to happen is that the, the piston will come up to top dead center and it will hit the valve because the valve hasn't hasn't closed. Um, it's called a valve strike. And um, sometimes the valve strike will, will, will break the head of the valve right off the stem, right at the weld point. And um, obviously that'll shut the cylinder down pretty well, but once in a while, if it, if that happens, and that broken off valve uh, head winds up getting in just the wrong position, it can shatter the piston the next time it comes up and uh, can cause a, a total catastrophic failure of the engine where it goes to no power. So anyway, we don't want this to happen. 
and we need to understand why it happens and uh, and and what we can do to prevent it. So let's talk a little bit about why it happens. And almost everything that you may have read about this is is wrong. Uh, conventional wisdom, if you Google st sticking valves, you'll you'll get a lot of hits. And almost every hit that you get, if you read it, it will attribute valve sticking to the buildup of carbon deposits on the valve stem and inside the valve guide. Um, that results from the engine oil coming into contact with a hot valve stem and, and carbonizing or coking. Now, that's a very convenient explanation, but it isn't right. If it were true, then um, valve sticking could be mitigated by operating the engine cooler. And in fact, a lot of the stuff you read will, will recommend that operating the engine cooler will help this problem go away. But in fact, that's just exactly op uh, opposite of the truth. Engines that run cooler exhibit more valve sticking, not less. And in fact, Lycoming's um, exhibit a lot more valve sticking and their valve stems run a lot cooler than, than, than Continental's. Um, and the reason Lycoming valves um, run cooler than Continental's is because Lycoming's use sodium-filled uh, valves. Uh, the, the stem is hollow and there's liquid sodium in there that's designed to transfer the heat more effectively from the valve uh, to the stem to the uh, through the valve guide and, and to the cylinder head. And um, so, and I'll, I'll show you a larger picture of this diagram in a minute, but uh, what it'll show is that the lower valve stems, which is where the, the deposits occur, um, are considerably cooler on Lycoming's than on Continental's. And yet Lycoming's suffer a lot more sticking problems in Continental's. So the notion that, that it's the heat that is causing the problem is just not correct. Um, So it is true that valve sticking is caused by buildup of deposits, but it's not true that those deposits are carbonized oil, and it's not true that running the valves cooler is going to make the problem get better. Um, the the smartest guy I know uh, on this whole subject is a fellow by the name of Ed Collins. Some of you may be familiar with him, but he's technical director of aircraft specialties lubrication, which is he's the guy that invented cam guard. Um, for many years, he run he ran the the engine lab at at uh, Exxon, and uh, he is uh, an expert on a lubrication uh, expert lubrication uh, chemist. He also happens to own a Cessna 182, so he's really interested in all this sort of stuff in, in terms of. Uh, of uh, general aviation engines. Ed um, performed a laboratory chemical analysis of, uh, of the crusty buildup that occurs on the lower um, exhaust valve stems of Lycoming's. And what he found was that those deposits uh, consisted primarily of lead, carbon, bro carbon bromine, and oxygen. Um, which is a, a, a compound called lead oxybromide. And the, these deposits, these lead oxybromide deposits originate not from the oil, um, but from the tetraethyl lead uh, that is blended into 100 low lead um, abgas. Uh, the tetra, tetraethyl lead is, is an octane booster. Uh, that is what allows 100 low lead to have as high octane as it as it does um, and um, about two grams of this stuff very very toxic ugly stuff uh, are blended into each gallon of 100 low lead between two and four grams depending on the formulation um, and the way this stuff works is that as the air fuel mixture is compressed in the cylinder um, the tetraethyl lead uh, is converted to lead oxide. Lead oxide is actually um, what increases the uh, the octane by inhibiting uh, detonation. Um, lead oxide does that very well, but it's it's kind of nasty stuff because it is um, is conductive. 
and it has the nasty habit of coating and lead fouling spark plugs. And um, unlike oil fouling, when a spark plug gets lead fouled, um, there's no way to clear that up uh, other than removing the spark plug and picking out the, the little globules. Um, so this is a real problem in, in any engine that's run on leaded avgas, which uh, most of us still are, unless you are lucky enough to have an engine that you can run on unleaded MOGAS, in which case you're, you're probably not going to have this problem and you're probably not going to have any sticking valves. Um, so to, to solve this, this lead fouling problem, um, Avgas has a lead scavenging agent blended into it called ethylene dibromide. Um, and what ethylene dibromide does is it, it combines with the lead oxide to convert it to lead bromide. Um, and, and that's um, a molecule that remains in the gaseous state at, at um, uh, any temperature above 1100 degrees Fahrenheit. And, and so in, instead of condensing on the spark plugs, uh, the lead bromide uh, typically just passes out the exhaust um, because it remains in a gaseous state at the temperatures at, at which the exhaust gases are. Now it turns out that the chemical reaction um, between lead oxide and ethylene dibromide to form lead bromide gas is fairly complicated. Um, takes a, goes through a number of intermediate steps, about eight different steps, and takes a significant amount of time. The time it takes for this chemical reaction to take place is a function of temperature. The hot, hotter the combustion temperature, the faster the lead, ox, lead oxide is scavenged into lead bromide gas. And it, it, because it just speeds up that chemical reaction, which is fairly complicated. As I said, there's there's eight distinct steps during which intermediate forms uh, the, called lead oxybromide are formed that ultimately wind up becoming lead bromide gas. And at each step, the uh, condensation temperature uh, goes up. Um, so it's these intermediate products um, that cause the valve sticking problem. And of course, the cooler uh, the uh, combustion temperature, um, the slower this reaction takes place and the more these lead oxybromides hang around before they get converted to lead bromide uh, gas. Now, all of these compounds that we're talking about um, lead oxide, the various forms of lead oxybromide and, and the lead bromide gas have condensation temperatures. Um, and below the condensation temperatures, they change from a gas to a solid and start forming deposits. Um, so it's important to keep these things above that condensation temperature in order to get them out of the cylinder and, and not to create uh, deposits. Um, the condensation temperature of lead oxide is quite high. Um, and so uh, that's why it condenses so readily on spark plug electrodes. Um, we, we would really like uh, something that has a much lower condensation temperature so it, so it remains in gaseous form. The intermediate forms of lead oxybromides um, have lower condensation temperatures than than lead oxide. Uh, it starts out, they start out at 1470 and gradually work down to about 1300 degrees after these eight steps. And then the final end product, which is lead bromide gas, um, has a condensation temperature of 1100 degrees. So it remains gaseous at any temperature above 1100. So as these various compounds exit the cylinder, they tend to condense and form hard deposits on any surface that they encounter that's cooler than the condensation temperature. And the coolest surface that they're likely to encounter on their way out is that portion of the exhaust valve stem, the lower portion, that, that is, is kept cool 
when the valve is closed because it, because that stem is inside the valve guide but then as the valve opens it projects out into the gas stream as it, that's that's going out of the exhaust port and and because it's been heat sinked all of this time it 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 starts out being quite cool as the exhaust gas passes over it now again if we look at the heat map um, a typical continental valve stem temperatures the, these lower valve stem temperatures the, the lower part of the stem that's that's right above where the head gets welded to the stem um, are are just barely high enough to inhibit the condensation of of uh, of lead of lead oxybromides but the lycoming lower temperatures uh, lower valve stem temperatures are quite a bit cooler because the sodium filled um, exhaust uh, valve stem uh, carries the heat away much more effectively and so um, those the lower stem on lycomings is is typically cooler uh, than um, than the condensation temperature of uh, of these lead oxybromide uh, uh, products that, that are involved in the scavenging reaction so these low temperatures are really good for valve longevity but they're not really good for valve sticking um, because the cooler these the the valve stem temperatures the more uh, it, it's going to promote condensation of these deposits. So now that we know um, what these things, what these deposits are made of, and what causes them to form, and it's not heat, it's really cool. Um, let's talk about how we can uh, prevent sticking. And, and the key to prevent preventing valve sticking is to keep combustion temperatures high enough that, um, first of all, the scavenging reaction goes quickly and that that the the uh, these intermediate lead oxybromide um, uh, compounds uh, turn into uh, lead bromide which which has a, a the, the a relatively cool condensation temperature that, that isn't likely to uh, condense on anything um, so uh, keeping combustion temperatures up speeds up this reaction and it also results in higher valve stem temperatures again will min that will minimize the condensation of these uh, lead oxybromides into solid um, deposits that, that are what are calling the problem now we don't have an instrument that measures um, valve stem temperature of course um, but the best proxy we have is uh, cylinder head temperature um, it's not egt by the way it's cylinder head temperature that we're interested in now most of us know that it's important not to let cylinder head temperature get too high for optimal engine longevity but some pilots seem to think that if a little cht reduction is good then a lot of cht reduction must be better and that's just not the case because if you reduce cht too far then you're promoting the the uh, the formation of these deposits. Um, so while excessively hot CHTs are are bad for the cylinder, excessively cool CHTs are are uh, will will promote valve sticking. So what we would like to try to do is keep cylinder head temperatures in the sweet spot if we can, somewhere around 350 to 400 as much as possible. Um, now, there are some uh, aircraft, some installations um, that have especially good cooling systems where the CHTs don't get as high as 350. Um, and if you have one of those and, and, and your CHTs um, won't, won't get any higher than that, then you're going to want to double check and see whether you're getting these deposits um, forming excessively or not. And we'll talk about how you do that uh, in, in a moment. But generally what we would like to do is keep CHT somewhere in the 350 to 400-ish range um, as much as possible. It's also really, really important to lean aggressively during taxi and other low 
power ground operations. I see a lot of pilots taxiing around with a mixture control um, all the way uh, forward. That's a habit they probably got used to in primary training where the instructor basically told them to leave the red knob alone. But that's that's really quite bad uh, for this sticking problem. An awful lot of the deposits that are, cause the problem occur when the engine is is operating at low power um, during uh, during idle and taxi and and uh, other low power operations. So uh, when the engine is operating at very low power, it's particularly important to lean aggressively and. You should be leaning the mixture shortly after you start the engine uh, and lean it to at least to maximum RPM, which is best power mixture. And, and I like to le lean it even a little bit more brutally than that. So finally, let's talk a little bit about maintenance actions. Um, we already, already talked about the pilot actions that we can take to try to minimize this problem. Um, but how do we know if we if we have the problem? Well, um, of course, the morning sickness symptoms are, are one of the tip-offs. Um, but there are some maintenance things. Lycoming has a service bulletin 388C, where they recommend doing what's called a wobble test, uh, where the um, yeah, you you partially disassemble the valve uh, train to take the rockers off and stuff, and then you hook a a special fixture to the valve stem and you use a dial indicator and you try to push the valve stem first one way and then the other and see how much wobble there is. And there's a spec that says a minimum and maximum acceptable wobble. And if the wobble is too large and it means the valve guide's worn, and if the, but if the wobble is too small, it means that you've got excessive deposits forming uh, and the clearance isn't isn't sufficient. Um, now, that's an okay test. Lycoming recommends doing it either every 400 hours or every 1,000 hours, depending on what engine model you've got. Like uh, Continental doesn't really have uh, a procedure like this, but um, there's actually a lot easier way to, to to, to get a good idea of what's going on. And that is uh, using a borescope. Uh, you guys all know that I'm a big fan of uh, doing borescope inspections. And most mechanics, when they borescope a cylinder, they, they, they borescope it with the valve closed and they're looking at the color patterns and so on on the face of the valve. But, but if you turn the prop and open the valve all the way, and work the bore scope around, you can usually get a pretty good view of that lower valve stem and uh, and and see directly whether it seems to have an excess buildup of deposits. And this is something you can do anytime the top spark plug is out and it and it just takes a couple of minutes. It's a whole lot easier than doing the wobble test. So uh, while there is probably a place for the wobble test, um, I would, suggest that on a regular basis, certainly at least every annual inspection, and anytime you're doing spark plug maintenance, um, that, that you stick a bore scope in there and take a look at the valve with the with the valve, um, with, with the prop turn so that the valve's fully open so that you can see what's going on in those low, lower valve stems. Now, if it turns out that um, that you do have a valve that's starting to stick, um, that does not mean that the cylinder has to come off. Uh, there's a procedure um, for reaming the valve guide in place, and it involves dropping the valve into the cylinder uh, with a piece of dental floss or something so that you can fetch it back, and, and then reaming the guide, and then pulling the valve back into place. There are some good YouTube videos on this. Um, I think there's one called the rope trick because uh, part of the the procedure for uh, for uh, freeing up the 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 uh, the valve train and so on involves stuffing a bunch of rope into the into the combustion chamber so that you can cause the piston to hold the uh, the, the valve in place while you uh, 
while you remove the valve springs and so on. Um, so if you if you Google the rope trick and look for a YouTube video, you'll there's a pretty good video on how you do this. But the important thing I just wanted to get across is that if the valve is starting to stick, um, the remedy uh, does not involve removing the cylinder. It's less pain, a lot less painful than that, and it's something that you want to act on promptly um, as the, the, as soon as you. Uh, become aware of the problem because if it gets bad enough, then then it can do some real harm. And so, Tim, that's uh, that's really all I have in terms of prepared material. But we can uh, we can open it up for some Q and A. Okay, Mike. Great. A lot of questions come in so far. Let's kick off with James. He's just wondering, is the problem as bad if you can burn auto gas? Uh, if it's unleaded fuel, the problem is going to be much, much less, or almost non-existent. And um, that's why I, I think anybody that, that can use unleaded fuel would would do a, a lot better uh, using unleaded fuel. Uh, Tetraethyl lead is, is an effective octane booster, but in every other regard, it's just terrible stuff. It causes this valve sticking problem. It causes stuck rings it, uh, because of lead sludge that develops that that causes the rings to get stuck in in their in their grooves. Um, it, it's it's just very very problematic stuff. And um, the FA, of course, had been working for a long time on on trying to come up with a with an acceptable unleaded substitute for 100 low lead, and they seem to be way behind schedule on that, unfortunately. But the sooner we can start running our engines on unleaded fuel, the the, the better as far as I'm concerned. And if you do have uh, an engine that can run on, on unleaded fuel, typically any low compression engine that was originally certificated for uh, 8087 or 91 octane fuel is eligible for an auto fuel STC. Um, and if you have the ability to to get that fuel to put in the airplane, um, it I I think it's very advantageous. Anybody who flies behind a Rotax knows that the Rotax was basically designed to run on unleaded gas, and you can run it on 100 low lead. But if you run it on 100 low lead very much, um, the the maintenance intervals are halved. There are, are all sorts of other negative consequences, like you can't use a uh, uh, synthetic oil in the in the engine and so on um, but the short answer is if you can run on unleaded fuel uh, it's a really good idea to do that there's a whole bunch of questions coming in from many people about tcp and will the use of tcp um, help with this issue what are your comments on that um you know, I, I I almost made up a slide about that because I know that's a common question, but let, let me let me address that. Um, TCP stands for tricresyl phosphate. TCP is actually a trademark of Alcor Inc. Um, and tricresyl phosphate um, is a chemical that is useful for a number of things. It's an extreme extreme uh, pressure additive uh, that's good for anti scuff. Um, if you put it in oil, but Alcor TCP is 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 an additive for uh, to put in the fuel, and um, um, what it 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 does is it uh, instead of converting the lead oxide to lead uh, lead bromide, it converts it to uh, to lead phosphate. Um, lead phosphate is a solid. Uh, it does not. It is non-conductive, so it doesn't foul plugs. So that's the that's the the, the reason that the, the TCP works as an anti-fouling additive is is that it converts the lead oxide into something that's non-conductive, so it won't short the plugs out. Um, and a fair amount of that lead phosphate goes out the exhaust, but some of it remains in the combustion chamber and 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 creates lead phosphate deposits which um which uh, have the unfortunate characteristic of um of, of combining with engine oil to create um oily uh, deposits in the uh, 
in, in the cylinder. So we generally recommend not using TCP uh, unless you have a really persistent um, lead fouling problem with your spark plugs that you have not been able to resolve with aggressive leaning or with the use of fine wire spark plugs or projected nose spark plugs, the BY series spark plugs. Uh, that are much less susceptible to uh, uh, to fouling. Um, and if if you've got a really persistent spark plug fouling problem, uh, then then we would suggest trying a TCP. Um, but if you don't have a persistent lead fouling problem, we'd sort of recommend not using it. Again, it 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 does. Uh, result in the formation of deposits. Uh, they just aren't conductive, so they don't short out spark plugs. Uh, another problem with TCP is that unlike ethylene dibromide, which is blended in with the with 100 low lead, uh, TCP is something you have to carry around with you uh, so that you can stick, stick it in the fuel tank every time you get fueled. And uh, Alcor TCP is, as, is not just tricresyl phosphate, it's tricresyl phosphate in a toluene um, solvent uh, carrier. Uh, and uh, toluene is sort of nasty stuff to be carrying around in the airplane uh, because it's, uh, it's a high VOC, quite toxic uh, substance. So if you do use TCP and you carry it around in the plane, please try to carry it in a in a sealed uh, box or something like that so that if somehow the the thing leaks it won't fill the cockpit full of fumes it's it, it's sort of nasty stuff if you're if you're flying a twin like mine I guess you could stick it out in the wing lockers where, where it wouldn't where, where it wouldn't get you sick if it got if it leaked but any rate that's that's pretty much the the what I wanted to say about about TCP it, it does have its use but in, in general, we, we don't recommend it unless there's really a persistent plug fouling problem. There's other additives people are questioning also. Several people are also wondering about decalin and the use of decalin. Does that help? Um, I'm not familiar with it, so I really can't comment on it. Sorry, Tim. Okay. How about Marvel Mystery Oil? <laughs> that always comes up. Lots of questions on Marvel yeah, Mystery Oil. Marvel Mystery Oil is 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 uh, is basically a, a petroleum distillate with a, some red food coloring and a little perfume in it. I think that's that part. That's the mystery part of it. Um, it it does not uh, do anything about it. It it won't reduce valve sticking. Um, it 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 won't increase your TBO. Um, the only thing I know of that Marvel Mystery Oil has shown some effectiveness in is freeing up um, uh, sticky valve lifters. If you hear a lifter clatter, um, uh, it, it might be worth uh, throwing some uh, some MMO in the tank to try to free up the, the lifter because um, it, it'll it'll dissolve um, uh, uh, petroleum deposits. But but I guarantee you it will not dissolve um, lead oxybromide deposits. In fact, almost nothing short of sandblasting will, will get rid of lead, lead oxybromide de deposits. They are really, really nasty. And Robert's wondering, does CamGuard or AvBlend reduce the chance of sticking valves? Not to the best of my knowledge, no. The uh, CamGuard, obviously, any, but I'm a big fan of CamGuard and I've been using it for uh, over a decade in my airplane, and it it does all sorts of very good things, but that that's not one of the things that it does. It it it's not going. It's not a lead scavenging agent at all. And in fact, basically nothing that goes into the oil is going to solve this problem. Um, this is a problem that has to be solved in the fuel. And Kelly's just wondering: Are there any downsides using unleaded fuel? Well, the downside of using unleaded fuel is 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 that the octane is reduced, and so you, you can't 
use the unleaded fuel in a high compression engine without risking detonation. Um, that's why the auto fuel STC is available only for low compression engines and why you, you can't use it in a eight and a half to one or eight or 8.6 to one compression ratio engine that was certified for, for 100 octane fuel. Why you can't really use it in a turbocharged engine again, because the um, if the compression ratio is high enough, you need a higher octane rating in order to prevent detonation. Um, but if you have a low compression engine, no, there's no disadvantage. And one, one of the things that, that, that I always hear brought up is this business about how well, you, don't you need some lead to help lubricate the valves? There's absolutely no evidence that lead plays any role in that. That's just an old wives' tale. And, you know, we've got gazillions of cars out there running with with slide valves, just like we have in our airplanes, and, and, and they run on unleaded fuel, and they don't have sticking valve problems. Um, in fact, you know, not, not having lead is the best way to prevent sticking valve problems. Um, you definitely, lead, lead isn't, you know, the notion that lead helps the valves is just absolutely the opposite of the truth. It, the, the lead is causing these problems and getting rid of it's the best thing we can do. Jeremy's wondering, what oil do you recommend to avoid valve sticking? Um, doesn't matter. Uh, it has no effect on it one way or the other. I mean, I have oil recommendations, but 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 they have nothing to do with with valve sticking. And Daryl's just wondering, can sticking valves be discovered by low cylinder compression? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, uh, uh, in fact, one of the one of the procedures that are commonly is commonly um, uh, performed uh, if if you do a if you do a compression test and 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 you get low compression and you hear air coming out the exhaust valve, they, they want you to do what's called staking the valve, which, which basically means taking the rocker cover off and taking a rubber mallet and, 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 and tapping the, 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 the rocker to try to jostle the valve closed uh, while the cylinder's being pressurized. And, and of course, if, if, if staking the valve solves your compression problem, the chances are the valve was kind of sticky to begin with. Um, so yes, uh, sticking valves will sometimes show up in a compression check, but you can't count on that. Um, again, um, uh, morning sickness is a real good indication uh, of a sticking valve problem. Um, a wobble test, obviously, it can be done, although it's fairly invasive. Um, and and doing a bore scope inspection with the valve open and looking at the uh, at the lower valve stem to see how how, how much deposit buildup there is 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 an easy non-invasive thing you can use to keep track of this. Many people were asking, how long does morning sickness typically last? Well, I mean, there's not a good answer to that because it it depends on on how how far the the deposit buildup has has gotten and typically it starts off off lasting a very short time and then it gets longer and longer as the as the as the buildups continue to build up um so there's not really a good answer to that paul is wondering does preheating the engine mask morning sickness it probably would yeah if you get the cylinder head temperatures up high before you Start it, then then it it probably would mask uh, morning sickness. Cassandra is just wondering: Can sodium filled valves be replaced with solid valves to avoid valve sticking? Why or why not? Well, for, first of all, um, for a certificated aircraft, it wouldn't be legal to do that. And second of all, um, even if it was an experimental aircraft, I'm not sure you could find. <laughs> You could find a solid stem valve that would fit a lycoming, so it's probably not a practical solution. But um, the lycoming uses sodium-filled valves for, you know, for for a valid reason. Um, and if if the engine is operated properly, um, then the valve sticking is is not likely to be a big problem. 
And of course, if the engine is run on unleaded fuel, it's almost certainly not going to be a big problem. Okay, uh, a lot of people kind of wondering about this. I'll ask uh, Joseph's question to sum them. Um, if you ream the valve guide and remove the deposits, what about the deposit on the lower valve stem? How do you deal with that? Well, you can deal with that as well. When you drop the valve into the into the cylinder, when you're doing this rope trick procedure, um, you you can you can uh, work the valve toward to uh, to the spark plug hole and and uh, and get access to the lower valve stem that way and 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 uh, clean it up a little with a little bit of emery cloth. Mark's wondering, what are the recommended maximum sustained CHTs for Lycoming and Continental engines to minimize uh, valve sticking? Well, I don't know. I, I didn't quite understand the, the, the way that was phrased. As far as maximum CHTs, if he's really talking about maximum CHTs. Maximum course, sustained, he said. Maximum yeah, of course. Lycoming sets the, the CHT red line at 500 degrees Fahrenheit, but that's a ridiculous value. That's really only an emergency sort of uh, maximum. Um, my recommendation has, has been to, to try to keep cylinder head temperatures on Lycoming snow hotter than 420 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and on Continental snow hotter than 400 degrees and preferably would like to see them a little bit lower than that. Um, Walt's just wondering, will running unleaded fuel tend to clean up any deposits on the valve stem? No, once the deposits are formed, only mechanical removal will, will remove them. They're extremely nasty and there's no solvent or anything like that that that, that will remove them. They, they would have to be removed uh, uh, mechanically. So, I mean, the best bet is to, is to just to try to prevent them from forming in the first place. Uh, Mike's wondering, would electronic ignition with advanced help with lower octane fuel and aircraft? Um, well, I'm not sure I understand the connection there. Um, the the uh, electronic ignition and EIS that 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 advances the ignition timing um, in flight um, results in um, in it actually results in somewhat cooler exhaust gas temperatures. Um, uh, because the the, uh, the the peak temperature occurs earlier in the cycle and it's, it has more time to cool off by the time the exhaust valve opens and the exhaust gas starts going out the exhaust port, which is when the condensation issue on the valve stem occurs. Um, but an awful lot of the, these deposits don't form in crews where the EMAG would be doing the advancing anyway. An awful lot of the deposits uh, form uh, on the ground and, and during low power operations where they where the, the, uh, the advance isn't even taking place. Dwayne is wondering: Is it possible for an intake valve to stick? Um, I suppose it's possible. It's not something I've ever seen happen. The intake valves tend to be pretty pretty trouble free. Tim's wondering, will running lean of peak help? With respect to the um, uh, to the sticking problem? Yes. Um, well, it, um, Running lean a peak does does tend to keep things a lot cleaner, but if you ran very profoundly lean a peak, then you would be lowering the uh, the, the the gas temperature um, 
to the point where it would probably interfere with scavenging. So I think this is one of the question, one of the areas where uh, a, a little Lena Peak is probably helpful. A huge amount of running stream Lena Peak, like 100 F Lena Peak, would probably aggravate the problem. William's wondering, uh, Mike, if you've ever seen a mechanic unstick a valve with a two by four and a hammer. He says, <laughs> I've seen it. Uh, mechanics do that several times. And I've always wondered if it was a good practice. Well, well it's, cer it's certainly isn't going to solve the problem for very long because, you know, maybe, maybe you can unstick the valve that way, but but you're not um, opening up the 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 stem to, to guide clearance. Uh, so it, it, I mean, it's just likely to, to stick again. Um, so it, it does, it's, it's not a cure, certainly. Okay, just looking for, we got a lot of questions, but so many of them tonight are, are really related to additives and uh, some things that we've already talked about and you've already answered. Mm -hmm. So I'm still trying to get through the list here, bear with me here. Um, this is one of these great minds think similar things kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Dennis is just wondering, uh, won't a mag check and engine cylinder monitor tell right away if it's a fouled plug or not? Um, talking about, you know, when you're taxiing out, uh, some people think it's a fouled plug, but it's really it's a sticking valve. Yeah, well, of course, typically people do mag checks when they get to the run-up area, and, and typically by the time they get to the run-up area to do their mag check, the the, the morning sickness has has gone away um, because there's been enough time for the the errant cylinder to warm up enough to unstick its its uh, sticky valve. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, of course, uh, a, a, an engine monitor uh, will will tell you can tell you definitively if you have a foul plug and if so, which plug it is. Rick is wondering, when a valve sticks during early stages of morning sickness, how does it not cause engine damage, bent push rod or struck by piston? Um, well, in, in the early stages of sticking, typically what happens is the valve opens and then it almost closes all the way, but doesn't quite close all the way. And, so it's closed enough to avoid a valve strike. Um, it, it's not stuck hard enough that the cam can't push it open. It's just stuck hard enough that the, that the valve springs have a, are having a hard time pulling it all the way closed. And, and of course, if you, if you think about it, the, the lower on the valve stem it, it, you are, the more deposits are going to build up. So uh, the the beginning phases of a sticking valve are going to are going to mostly affect that that last little bit of closing that the valve has to do to seal. And Richard, just wondering uh, for your comment, I also think that deposits of lead uh, salts can cause sticking of the wastegate valve axle. Your thoughts? Oh, absolutely. Um, that 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 that's absolutely true, and you know when we have sticking wastegates, which are a pretty f common problem, uh, everybody like tries to squirt them with with mouse milk uh, penetrating oil. Um, but if if the problem is is due to uh, uh, to to build up of of lead deposits, the penetrating oil is not going to help, and so that's why we periodically have to have to send the wastegate in uh, in for overhaul because those deposits uh, can only be removed mechanically. Chris is wondering, uh, there have been talks about a lead-free 100 low lead replacement for a while now. Do you have any information on the progress of this initiative? 
The only information I have is it's way behind schedule because the, the, they were supposed to have it ready by the end of of uh, 1990. I mean, of of, of uh, 2019, and obviously they didn't make it. And there, there. I'm trying to remember when it was, but the FAA came out with the the tech center came out with something that's saying they were they were a year behind schedule, and uh, I I haven't heard any real recent update on that and i don't know why they're they're struggling so much with this because they had a couple of candidate fuels that they were that they were testing that they said were very promising uh the swift fuel was one of them and i think shell had a, had a candidate that they were testing but apparently they ran into some issues with them and they sent them back and and, and said you, you you need to tweak it to eliminate some problems rather and I don't really know the details. All I know is that they got considerably behind the schedule that they had originally announced. Robert's wondering, do the valve springs lose their tension and might this cause valve sticking? Um, the, the valve springs can uh, lose their strength. Um, and and it's particularly if, uh, if, if, things get too hot uh, up up in the 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 rock rear we we've seen cases for example where the exhaust valve guide got worn sufficiently that a significant amount of exhaust gas could get up through the annulus between the valve stem and the valve guide and and start to torch the uh the valve springs and anneal them so that they lost their springiness um however if the guide is worn that much then then you're not going to have valve sticking problems because <laughs> you're going to have very loose fit. You're going to have other problems, uh, but but valve sticking would not be would not be one of them. Um, if the valve springs remain uh, relatively cool like they're supposed to, um, I, I'm not aware that they just normally uh, lose springiness over time. I think they mostly lose springiness due to excessive heat. Sam's just wondering, how does valve guide wear affect this problem? Well, I mean, I guess valve guide wear would actually improve this problem, although it causes some 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 other problems. Um, um, but again, Lycoming's uh, valve guides are pretty hard, and they're pretty resistant to wear. Uh, Continental valve guides tend to be considerably softer. Uh, Continental in the in the uh when was it around 1990-ish time frame uh, experimented with some harder guides that were, were called nitrolloy guides but they ran into enough problems with them uh that that they switched back to the, the previous guide material which is called guide ni resist which is not nearly as uh, as as hard so as far as i'm able to tell um uh Lycoming valve guides are more resistant to to um, to wearing um, than uh, than continental guides are. It's more of a problem with continentals, and that may also contribute a little bit to why Lycomings are are, are uh, more prone to sticking because in continental engines, if deposits build up on the valve stem, th th they're probably going to going to just bell mouth the guide because the guide is relatively soft whereas in the lycomings the guides are, are more resistant to that because they're made of harder material joe is wondering how would one increase the chts when your engine normally runs in the 330s well the, f the first thing i would say is uh, be before you change your operating procedure you know, go stick a borescope in there and see if you have a problem. If, if you don't, if you don't have a problem, if the lower valve guide, uh, valve stems are not looking crudded up, um, then just keep doing what you're doing and don't worry about this. Um, if you, uh, if you um, do seem to be having a problem and, and you want to reduce the, the, the rate at which these deposits build up, um, I mean, the main tools that you have are 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 leaning uh, to bring the temperatures up, 
and whatever control you have over cooling airflow. Um, if you have cow flaps, for example, use how you use your cow flaps would would affect it, and so on. And Daryl is wondering, is there a particular time during the TBO life of the engine that sticky valves begin to show up? I'm not particularly aware uh, uh, of that. They, they, oh, what did I just do? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any particular time in the in the engine's life cycle that sticky valves are likely to show up they can they can kind of show up uh, at, at any point and you typically uh, deal with them and then at some time in the future they might show up again Ives is wondering what is your recommendation if the valve sticks in flight and the engine vibrates heavily is reducing the RPM as much as possible the best approach? Well, I mean, yeah, if you have that problem, you're, you're gonna wanna throttle back and land at the at the next opportunity. Um, but you know, if 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 what happened to you is a is a bent push rod, there isn't anything that's gonna once that happens, that valve isn't gonna operate anymore. If, if any, if something in the valve train breaks, I've also seen the 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 ears in the cylinder head casting that support the rocker arms. I've seen them fracture, but most most commonly, it's a it's a bent push rod because that's usually the the weakest link in the chain if a if a valve sticks hard in in flight. But main thing is try not to let that happen to be, by being um, sensitive to the early symptoms and and attending to them right away rather than letting them get that bad that that, that they can they can stick in flight. Dwayne's wondering when reaming a valve guide, should you use a reamer that is just big enough to remove the deposits or just slightly larger? Um, well, there's a, I, I would follow the the, the Lycoming service bulletin on that, which specifies all of that stuff. And Keith's wondering, what indications on your engine monitor will tell you you have an early stage sticking valve if the engine is running smoothly? Well, um, mainly that during the during the 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 initial morning sickness when when the engine is just warming up, you you'll probably feel some roughness, and if you look at your engine monitor, you'll see that. One of your cylinders is 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 not producing power, is not generating uh, uh, EGT or normal EGT, um, and th that'll tell you what you need to know. And of course, it'll tell you what cylinder is involved. And if you don't have an engine monitor, well, first of all, shame on you. But if you don't have an engine monitor and you feel morning sickness like that, I would suggest shutting down. And then opening the cowling and and just putting your hand on 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 the rocker covers and figuring out which cylinder is cold. The, the engine monitor would tell you that if you had one, but if you didn't, if you don't have one and you want to know which cylinder is the is the culprit, you can just feel which which cylinder which cylinder head isn't isn't warm. Tom's wondering, in reference to your exhaust valve logarithm program, what engine monitor sensors are required? He says, I have an EDM 700, but no fuel flow sensors. Would your program detect exhaust issues without a fuel flow function? Yeah, um, he's, I think he's referring to our, our um, sticking exhaust, exhaust valve analytics that I uh, mentioned briefly during a an earlier webinar that I did on uh, on predictive analytics, we're actually still working on on that algorithm, um, and uh, uh, so I'm not sure exactly what 
input parameters it will require in its in its final form. Um, but uh, but EGT and CHT are the the most important inputs um, to that that algorithm. Um, we we look at um, RPM and fuel flow if we have it, but I'm not sure that it's essential uh, to to that algorithm working. But as I say, that that that, that stuff is still in in uh, in in development right now, and it's it's a it's a work in process, so I can't sort of give you a final answer on what it's going to require. Well, Mike, that pretty much wraps the subject of, uh, you know, all the questions that have come in. A lot of them were kind of the same there. Please take a moment, uh, wrap it up here. Um, I was showing probably over 900 people logged in tonight. Great turnout. Excellent. Excellent. It's amazing. Amazing what COVID will do, right? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, I don't know. I've, it's been really nice to see uh, the the attendance at the webinars recently. Um, at any rate, it's kind of the usual stuff. If you're not on my uh, newsletter list, uh, you can go to SavvyAviation.com and click the button to get on the list. We send out, uh, we're now sending out a monthly newsletter and we're also sending out weekly um, sort of true stories of, of, of various sorts of interesting things that have happened to um, aircraft owners. And um, so it's, it's it's an interesting mailing list. I think you'll find it very interesting stuff. If you, if you don't, of course, you can unsubscribe anytime you want to. Um, I do have four books uh, on Amazon. Uh, if you haven't read them all, I encourage you to go get them. And if you have read them, uh, I would really appreciate it if you'd go uh, onto Amazon and, and post reviews. Uh, I'm in the process of uh, turning those books into audio books. I'm uh, very close to being done with the, with Manifesto, which hopefully will be the first one that will be published in audio book form. Um, upcoming webinars, um, September webinar uh, entitled Fresh Annual is a story of, of a of a first time aircraft buyer who uh, 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 decided to accept a, uh, a, a fresh annual inspection in lieu of a pre-buy and the, and the predicament that he got into. And it, it'll be interesting for anybody who uh, is contemplating uh, buying or selling an airplane. Um, in October, uh, we'll be talking about the looming mechanic shortage. Um, uh, I think that there's a, already a, a serious shortage of of a and p's uh who work on general aviation aircraft and i see that problem getting worse we'll be talking about what the factors that are causing it is and um uh, stuff that a bunch of my colleagues who run shops have been telling me about this but it's a a problem that anybody who has a general aviation aircraft and 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 relies on A and P's to do maintenance is or gonna really needs to need to be concerned about. And then uh, November uh, webinar called Your Engine's Life's Blood is where we're going to talk about engine oil, engine oil additives, um, my various recommendations for engine oil and so on. And uh, finally, this is the last time I'm going to mention this. I think. Uh, the uh, our free savvy breakdown um, uh, program that we uh, initiated uh, at the beginning of the COVID-19 lockdown, um, where our AAA for GA, our 24-7 breakdown assistance service um, is uh, free, but it will stop being free the day after Labor Day, September 8th. And um, anybody who enrolls in, in the free program, which I would encourage you to do, um, will uh, on September 8th receive a killer offer <laughs> to uh, continue with the program at a huge discount to what we normally charge as an annual fee. And uh, so that's it, Tim. Until next time. Well, thank you very much, Mike. I sure do appreciate your presentation tonight, very good. And uh, just so you know, next month, 
we do start um, your monthly webinars using the webcast system, which does have 3,000 seats. So we're going to need to get the word out more, everybody, and invite your friend to log into the EAA webinar because we're going to be upping the seats uh, then uh, going forward from 1,000 up to 3,000. So that's good news, I think. That's exciting. Yeah. Well, thanks, Mike, again, and to everybody who tuned in tonight, thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Hope you can tune in next week. Thanks, everybody. See you next month.